Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to Gender and Society. This is lecture number 5 uh, on the history of women's movement. So uh, we have seen in the past uh, lectures how the concept of gender has evolved over time and um, we have seen you know certain um, debates that have been classical that, ha that are ongoing and some of these um, significant debates are with respect to um, the biological uh, condition of the human body versus gender as a concept. So uh, what we will do in this lecture is to um, look at some of the um, key moments in the history of women's uh, movement and then we will talk about um, whether we are um, you know in a phase of um, global women's movement or uh, you know it's an international women's movement. So what are the conceptual differences between the two? Um, what is the status of gender inequality across the world with respect to um, these uh, movements? And we'll finally look at some of the current ongoing women's uh, movements globally. So this is uh, in a nutshell what uh, we are going to uh, be talking about in this uh, lecture. And um, with this background premise in the lecture after this, um, we will be looking at uh, some of the key theories of um, feminism. So to start with, um, one of the significant um, points of uh, starting uh, to talk about the uh, ori origin of uh, the women's movement um, is to look at the feminist anthropology in the 1970s. So we see that the origin and mechanism of oppression to understand the changing women's position in society has been um, you know in, in that, that point of time um, you know an ongoing conversation for uh, feminists who were um, pursuing um, an anthropological way of um, inquiry. So it all um, boils down as um, Rosaldo in 1974 uh, talked about that sexual asymmetry is presently a universal fact of human social life. So you know as we have seen the biological condition of the body continues um, to inform much of the um, differences, much of the um, you know uh, discrimination that we um, see in society and and Rosaldo pointed out back in 1974 that um, you know it 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 was emerging as a universal fact of um, social life and women's oppression was seen as universal with varying manifestations so the idea that um, you know women were oppressed around the world was coming out as the universal so as um, more and more um, you know um, people got together more and more groups got together societies um, you know exchange views so as these networks flourished um, we see that the idea of women's um, oppression became a universal um, um, issue to deal with um, with varying manifestations so the nature of oppression would um, um, would be different but then uh, the issue would remain constant as oppression so this actually put several scholars um, to look at then if there is a relationship between how we understand the female is to male dynamic um, with regard to how we understand the nature is to culture dynamic. So um, Sherry Ortner um, actually posed this question that is female is to male as nature is to culture and I quote what could there be in the generalized structure and conditions of existence common to every culture that would lead every culture to place a lower value upon women. So um, as you can see from the quote, Ortner uh, in 1974 was questioning that um, you know we see this generalized uh, structure, this generalized pattern of oppression um, and, and what is it that you know 
that is probably true for every culture across um, the globe, every society across the globe, that would lead um, you know the every culture to place a lower value upon women. So there must be something that's going on, uh, you know, across societies that actually um, you know puts forward this uh, universal trend. So um, you know, more and more scholars became interested to find out that you know why is um, you know such a thing happening, and uh, the generalized structure in human societies, which makes women appear inferior, was. Um, you know, proposed by most of these uh, scholars that um, just like nature is universally valued less than culture, um, we see that there is an equation which kind of follows um, this logic of, uh, you know, um, superior inferior, if there is one, um, is that females are often equated with nature and males are often equated with culture and um, nature is often universally valued less than culture and by that um, uh, equation uh, we see that across human societies um, there is a low signifying um, you know factor being attached to um, women across the world. So here we need to um, revisit um, the idea of you know the idea of the biological condition of the body and and then the transition to gender and we see that there has been feminist um, anthropological discourse um, uh, particularly one that was put forward by Gail Rubin in 1975 who borrowed from um, classic anthropologists um, uh, like Levi Strauss um, you know uh, psych psychological um, you know um, um, influences from Freud and Lacan and um, you know it was put forward that biological sex and sexuality became socially significant when translated into cultural codes of gender. So it comes back to the same um, origin that across societies more and more um, the idea of biological sex was being codified um, as gender. So, it was being codified as synonymous to gender and um, you know this was th this was even all the more becoming um, significant um, when you know the two were equated. So, this was uh, one of the starting points to understand um, where do several of the women's movements that we have seen historically and we see now, um, you know, we see today um, come from. There has been an epistemological claim uh, in this regard also that despite all diversity encountered in women's oppression, there were sufficient similarity between women's experiences. So, uh, once you know it was established that um, you know women's oppression is a universal fact, it's an universal issue, and um, it was also seen that uh, despite all the diversity, so there you know there were different um, you know um, manifestations of these oppressions, and uh, despite that diversity, there were tremendous amount of similarity in the nature of women's experiences um, in societies. Um, and then power relationships in this regard were assumed to be universally the same. And with that assumption comes the danger of uh, making women and men, um, you know, being assumed as homogeneous categories, as we have talked about previously, that when we assume that all women across the world are same and all men across the world are same and they have, you know, um, the same experience that is all men have same, same experience and all women have same experience, we are uh, running into the danger of conceptualizing that um, you know each of these categories are homogeneous, that there is no difference, we are assuming that there is no difference between um, you know um, amongst women or amongst men. So, when you know this, uh, this, this is a uh, you know point of um, interrogation that when we talk of these power relationships then are these power relationships you know assumed to be universal are they constant are they you know the same everywhere across the globe. So, in the 1970s um, going into the 1980s we see that there was this um, you know 
constant effort um, of correcting the androcentric bias, whether it was in academia, whether it was in um, uh, networks, whether it was in organizations. So there was this, um, you know, um, an, an effort towards correcting the androcentric bias. The power dynamics um, of these spheres, that is the public private um, binary as uh, you know um, was um, emerging around this time um, was also um, looked at that how is you know this public private dichotomy um, emerging and does it make sense um, at all to talk about these uh, as two different spheres. The idea of the spheres and um, does it make sense to you know signify one sphere as uh, you know um, women's sphere and one, one sphere as men's sphere. So um, the power dynamics in the spheres of course um, could not be overlooked you know there were um, very significant um, power geometries that were emerging and, and the public private uh, binary the binary of the spheres were um, something that um, this uh, you know decades actually um, focused on. And the other um, point that this, uh, um, this uh, DK is also focused on was the power dynamics of Western feminist studies and the third world women. And here I quote uh, Chandra Mohanty that reproducing or representing a composite singular third world woman, an image which appears arbitrarily constructed but nevertheless carries with it the authorizing signature of Western humanist discourse. So not just um, you know between the spheres, not just between um, the women's and men's spheres, these power dynamics were also seen um, in scholarship, in discourse um, you know emerging from the Western feminist studies and also with the emerging uh, emergence of the category of the third world women that um, you know how are these categories then constructed and what informs you know um, these forms of uh, power negotiations within and between such categories. So we see that um, if we have to look at uh, some of the global contexts for an emerging uh, women's movement, we see that the United Nations has been at the um, you know forefront um, for um, facilitating and addressing to uh, you know facilitating um, solutions and addressing to several of these um, issues. And um, we see that the UN development decades of 1960s and 1970s um, actually um, focused on um, you know three primary points equality development and peace so um, for equality the focus was on western democracies for development um, the focus was on third world countries um, in the um, you know in the economic south and um, for peace the focus was um, the soviet bloc and these were based on neoclassical economic theories um, which held that wealth generated from economic growth would uh, trickle down to the poor and thus reduce poverty. Uh, the market in this case for the neoclassical economic um, theories was assumed to be the engine of economic growth and um, together with the United Nations um, the World Bank also played a very important role in promoting these strategies. So what we see that by the end of um, this debate um, or uh, you know by the end of this uh, decade that it was evident that the market alone could not reduce poverty and several of these um, you know objectives were not achieved. So based on this neoclassical economic um, theoretical model the United Nations proposed for the um, you know one of the pioneering ways of understanding where can we contextualize um, you know a global idea of a women's movement. And um, then we also see that there was an um, you know um, a focus on understanding whether these movements are um, you know international movements or whether these uh, movements are um, you know global movements. So we see that um, in the background uh, 
to the decade for women, which is the 1975, 1985, um, the decade for um, the UN decade for women, um, we see that there were three, um, you know, uh, factors or three movements identified that actually contributed to the, um, you know, birth um, of the decade of the um, women, the UN decade for the women in 1975. Um, 285. So, the first of these um, movements was the women's rights movement, which comes from the movement of um, for women's suffrage that came up in the 19th century um, as a common cause uh, for um, women. And then we see the, uh, you know, the human rights movement, um, which was, you know, where the UN had been a major um, you know, player for the human rights movement and we see the Universal Declaration on Human Rights was adopted by the world body um, in 1948 and we have the movements against colonialism which um, kind of identified struggles within larger processes of class struggle and nat natural, national liberation. So, um, you see that, um, you know, the background that led to the, um, you know, to the decade for women actually came with it, um, you know, having identified that there were already, you know, tensions um, that contributed to the uh, uh, women's movement. So, there were some um, key features that, um, you know, women's movement, uh, you know, in general um, had. So, it was a so any 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 women's movement, as um, Antropos points out, that any movement is a polit any women's movement is a political movement aimed at changing social conditions. So uh, there there are these you know inherent ideas um, towards changing the society um, towards better, and um, so they have a political agenda, a political movement understanding of women's relations to social conditions, which requires an understanding of gender within the broader structures of race, class, ethnicity, age and location. So, you know, how do you understand, uh, you know, with um, the intersectionality framework? So, we talked about the idea where gender can be and gender should be analyzed with, re with regard to the other axis of um, differences. And so, this was a call to understand women's relation um, to social conditions um, with regard to the broader structures. As a process flexible related to conditions of gender inequality or gender related injustice. So, again, um, you know, a women's movement, any women's movement in this regard um, is never static. So, it is ongoing, it is a process, it is flexible and it addresses um, either a global issue or um, you know a particular um, issue of gender inequality or gender related um, injustice at every at any given point of uh, time and place. The awareness and rejection of patriarchal privilege, so um, the you know the um, emphasis on removing the androcentric um, bias um, is what much of these um, movements were uh, you know um, going towards is an awareness and a rejection of a patriarchal privilege in society. And such movements are usually born or they originate when alienation or marginalization is experienced. So, the question of um, you know agency and structure. So, you know when one can do and have access to resources um, and have an influence on the social structure. So, you know, so these are some of the key key um, characteristics, key points to keep in mind to understand, you know, where do all of these um, women's movement actually come from. So, we also see that um, the women's movement over time gave rise to several um, networks and we see these networks in the form of associations in the form of um, organizations, um, um, you know, conferences. We see, you know, there are international days being celebrated, um, um, the UN International Women's Day, um, such as um, 8th March, the UN International Day Against Violence Against Women, um, 25th November. So, we see that, uh, you know, 
there was this rising consciousness that um, you know not just um, you know accepting or or um, becoming aware of the fact that there is a you know global sense of oppression um, um, across the globe um, for women, but also how can you know these um, these this variety, these varied ways of oppression, these varied natures of oppression, um, they are connected. And how can um, you know networks, organizations, um, associations work towards um, eradication, removal of such oppression, um, you know, globally? So, uh, if you follow this link that you see on the screen, it will take you to um, a very nice uh, list of key dates in international women's history that was compiled by the UN foundation and um, it shows you you know across um, you know the decades what have been some of these landmark uh, movements landmark events that actually um, mark uh, several of these women's movement. So, we see that uh, there were three waves or three sources of women's movement and the first wave um, that is um, you know felt for um, the earlier women's movement had three sources. So, there were the um, you know the backdrop were the colonized countries, the second was, was the social democratic communist organizations which is the late 19th early 20th century and the third source comes from the idea of reproductive health care. So, for the first source the colonized countries we do see there was an emergence of social reform movements aimed at transforming cultural practices around civil laws, marriage and family life. And much of these um, social reform movements were transforming social discourse around gender relations. So, um, we have seen that historically um, in the past uh, couple of lectures that you know the there was a history from where these social reform um, movements come and um, much of these uh, you know in the in the um, context of colonialism in the context of colonial con um, colon colonized countries we see that um, you know much of these uh, discourses much of these um, public uh, debates um, around um, gender they centered around civil laws uh, of marriage and family life. The second source um, was um, the social democratic communist organizations and um, it brings the women's question, the woman question as it is um, better known um, to the focus that um, you know um, and later on the woman question was actually taken up by uh, later scholars to understand um, you know the changing position of women in society or um, you know the public debates that were centered around um, you know the women's position in society, but really were not um, catering to or were not um, crafted or not debated um, for the women, uh, but all but but only for the um, rest of the society. So, we also see that um, in the second source um, that you know the institution and ownership of private property formed a bulk of this dialogue and um, you know um, catered to the growth of um, the movement. The third source comes um, from the, rep the idea of reproductive health care um, particularly with regard to legalizing contraception in Europe and North America. So, um, you know this was again a, a social shift with understanding um, rights over um, women's bodies and um, the very fact that contraception was legalized um, you know in Europe and North uh, America formed one of the um, very important basis for um, you know um, um, talking about the emerging uh, or changing positions of women in society. So, the second source um, of uh, uh, the earlier movements um, come from um, the, the histories uh, the social histories of the mid 20th century um, you know and the struggle against colonial domination. So, we see much of these um, you know um, debates actually come from the, um, the uh, strife towards you know um, liberation. Um, the anti-colonial movements, etc., and the experience shaping attitudes towards global and political 
inequality. So it was a you know a pan global um, issue that was felt. And the third source um, actually points out to the modern women's movement starting the 1960s um, as an anti-imperialist um, movement which actually saw um, you know revisioning or changing some of the social and gender mores or principles or values and a recognition of the personal as political. So, um, as I was saying that much of these debates were also um, carried on in the within the um, you know domain of family and marriage, they, the, the um, internal spheres, the intimate spheres of um, you know uh, society and uh, the idea of the personal as political emerged around this time with the third source. So, now the question is that are we talking about an international women's movement or are we talking about a global, a global women's movement. So, um, there are conceptually different and the way they differ um, is that for an international um, women's movement, we ask questions such as you know is an issue that is related here is it crossing borders. So, you know we are paying attention to nation states, we are paying attention to national boundaries and we are asking questions that um, the national cultural difference is recognized. So, um, you know that is much of the um, what the UN decade for women in 1975 to 85 addressed that uh, you know what are these um, national uh, differences, what are the cultural differences that we see between nations and you know how much of it is um, you know engaged in border crossing. So, uh, that is uh, one way of understanding the international women's movement. For the global women's movement, we see that um, there was a realization of different axes and economically speaking, um, there, there is an idea of the global north or global south and there were these policy debates that uh, started to happen and you know have been ongoing at global scales on um, issues such as environment, poverty, violence human rights and ideas that actually um, you know stitch the globe together. So, these are ideas, these are issues that we see across the globe. It is not just um, confined within a nation state, not just um, an issue of a particular country, but these are you know pan global, these are across the globe issues that the women's movement, the global women's movement um, you know try to address. So, this is conceptually how you know um, you know we understand the international women's movement versus the global women's movement. So now let's look at um, briefly uh, what has some of the scholarship on women's movement in India focused on. So we find that there are um, three broad trends in scholarship in scholarly uh, inquiry as we understand women's movement in India and we see that these um, trends uh, have been uh, you know understanding poor women's movements rural and urban, um, urban autonomous movements and new social movement. So, we see that um, in the, the classic areas of violence and reproduction um, and the um, you know emerging need to move beyond these issues to development ecology and religion were attributed to the um, understanding of the poor women's movement irrespective of whether it is rural or urban. And we see in the urban autonomous movement the trend um, that you know there was uh, more uh, focus more uh, you know um, um, impetus on understanding class and caste inequalities in the 1960s. So, how have you know class and caste um, you know worked with gender in society um, to uh, produce and reproduce several of these inequalities um, in the 1960s. And the new social movements um, which um, I quote from Amved is explicitly anti-systematic in their ideologies looking towards a casteless, non-patriarchal, non-looting sustainable society. They are involved in their own view in inherent conflict with the social order. So, this is a new form of a social movement that is not um, you know exclusively uh, rooted in caste, not exclusively rooted in um, gender or um, violence, but 
an impetus but a you know um, a movement that is geared towards achieving a sustainable society so you know it is it is again a, um, another approach to understand uh, from um, where the women's movements um, in India actually come from and what have been the various um, foci, what has been the various um, emerging trends to um, understand um, the background of women's um, movement in India. With that, um, we have the example of the uh, Sri Shakti or the women power where um, scholars such as Purgastha and Omved have um, you know uh, talked about it um, um, on a great deal that revisiting and analyzing issues of gender, caste, ecology and rural living and not just on women's oppression. So, these scholars are extending uh, the pushing the dialogue um, to an arena that crosses the gender boundary, that crosses the caste, class, um, you know, um, boundary and they are calling for an analysis to understanding the issues of gender, caste, ecology and rural living, um, you know, beyond understanding women's oppression. So, they are, they are calling for an understanding um, of these issues um, towards a drive towards, um, you know, attaining a sustainable um, society. And Sri Shakti as an alternative model of development based on biomass production, renewable energy and the environment at the local level was something that these scholars talked about that to bring in an alternative understanding of, um, you know, um, you know, renewing the environment, um, you know, addressing environmental issues at the local level. So, you know, as you can see that these, um, the idea of the women's movement across the globe, uh, you know, traveled a huge, um, you know, spectrum. And um, this is, um, you know, one of the um, examples where it is seen that, you know, it crosses um, the gender caste, uh, you know, boundary and it talks about the larger um, society um, and, you know, the alternative models to end oppression. Uh, scholars have also talked about the ancient Indian worldview of Prakriti and here we have, um, you know, the um, idea of creation or the feminine principle from which life arises and this idea has been um, in the backdrop in the, uh, the root of many of the women's ecology movements um, historically. Um, preservation and recovery of the feminine principle arise from a non-gender based ideology of liberation. So, it is seen that it is different both from the gender based ideology of patriarchy, women's subjugations and the gender based responses which have until recently been characteristic of the West. So, basically it comes from um, an idea that it is not just you know um, rooted in gender, but it is a non-gender based ideology for liberation different um, both from the gender based ideology of patriarchy and women's subjugation and um, you know again talking of a society that is sustainable ecologically speaking. We also see a trend um, in the scholarship um, talking about violence against women and this is a quite significant um, body of scholarship. Um, that has invested in understanding the various sources, reasons and um, impacts, the effects of violence um, in society and much of the scholarship is either um, focusing on social movement driven, um, you know, types of activities or um, the type of academic, um, you know, conversations. So, as Pukrasthe um, and others write, the definition of violence against women in India includes topics such as sex selective feticide, a recent form of violence, female infanticide and discrimination against women. So, um, the umbrella of violence against women actually, um, you know, brings with it um, all of these types of violence uh, that scholarship and social movement driven conversations have um, dealt with. So, we see that um, given that backdrop, the, uh, UNAC, the UNDP actually has given us a gender inequality index as you can see here and uh, you know it has identified health, empowerment and the labor market as three significant areas um, to be addressed 
to uh, you know um, end inequality or, or move towards um, equality. So, for health um, as you can see here that um, paying attention to maternal mortality ratio, adolescent birth rate um, and then um, you know influencing the female reproductive health index will you know form its chain to through female gender index to the gender the GII or the gender inequality um, index. And um, the idea of empowerment female and male population with at least secondary education, um, female and male shares of parliamentary seats, um, the female labor market index. So, uh, you know all of this would cater towards understanding of the status of um, empowerment, um, gender empowerment in any given society. And um, finally, the labor market um, talks about the female and male labor force participation rates um, and then um, you know moving through the male gender index to the uh, GII. So, um, this is one of the uh, you know ways one of the holistic ways of understanding um, through the UNDP's uh, you know um, GII that you know what is the road ahead to address um, you know the, the issue of inequality and how to end it. We see that um, the gender development index um, of the UNDP in 2015 um, actually has categorized um, you know countries according to very high human development, high human development, medium human development and low human development. And um, going by that um, you know arrangement we see the um, you know some of the top uh, ranking countries here, um, Norway, Australia, Switzerland, Germany, Denmark, Singapore, Netherlands, Ireland, Iceland, Canada and the US. And we see that um, India actually uh, is uh, 131st in the HDI rank um, which falls within the medium human development um, category of the UNDP um, with uh, value of um, a gender development index value um, of 0.819 as of 2015. So, um, you see that this is a long journey that um, you know a country still has to make to um, you know make uh, its way up the ladder, but uh, you know this is again a comparative um, idea uh, with where India stands with regard to the other countries. The UNDP um, has also um, you know um, charted it out on a world map to show how the gender inequality in the world um, you know looks like. And on this map as you can see um, that several of these um, countries or areas are you know shaded dark and several of them are um, you know shaded light. And um, you see that the ones that are shaded light have gender inequality less than 171. And then as you move um, towards the darker areas you see that um, it increases and particularly the areas that you see um, you know in, um, uh, in South Asia, parts of South Asia, parts of um, Africa um, that you know it, it registers a very high gender inequality. Um, according to this index. So, this is in a um, nutshell the state of gender inequality across the world. It was compiled by Time in 2014 and it is available as an online resource. So, you can go um, and, and check it out and see um, you know uh, it is interactive also. So, you know how um, you know gender inequality is currently um, you know um, um, uh, charted uh, as of now. The United Nations uh, Development Program has also identified eight major areas to improve gender equality starting with the autonomy of the body that is control over reproduction and sexuality and ending violence. So, um, again all the legislations um, you know all the um, movements with regard to rights over um, women's body uh, falls in uh, this um, conversation. The autonomy within family and household the freedom to marry, the freedom to divorce, the custody of children. So, with all these issues with regard to um, the um, intimate sphere of life um, within the family, within the household bringing in an autonomy. 
Um, political power with an increased role in decision making in governments um, or amplification, amplifying uh, women's voices um, in these decision making uh, processes in the government, in administration. So um, political power is um, one of the major areas that the UNDP has identified to improve gender equality. Social resources or access to health care and education very, very important. They have, you know, charted out goals, millennium development goals um, to uh, for betterment of, um, you know, health care, access to education, primary, secondary, uh, tertiary education and, um, you know, social resources, social um, capital, you know, health care and education as social capital um, in this regard. Material resources, access to land, house, credit um, forms a major area to improve gender equality um, according to the United Nations. The employment and income uh, structure, a fair distribution of paid and unpaid labor. So um, paying more attention to how um, you know, income and employment is distributed. Time. So, time management, relative access to leisure and sleep. So, this is where, uh, you know, much of the, um, you know, conversation and debates also go on that, uh, you know, once we have the idea of the, um, you know, difference in spheres, the men's and the women's sphere, and um, if we have to, um, you know, um, accept that, you know, there is um, an, uh, you know, a private sphere and a public sphere, then what is also happening is more and more women are becoming visible in the formal labor force. So, um, time management is becoming, um, you know, um, a, a primary area of debate, of conversation. And, um, you know, in this respect, the UNDP um, actually spells out, um, you know, very clearly that you know, we need to um, address the issue of time um, with regard to relative access to leisure and sleep um, in order to improve gender equality. And gender identity addressing problems with rigidity in gender division of labor. So this goes back to the whole discussion of um, understanding, um, you know, gender through biological sex and um, the problems that comes with that understanding, the challenges that come with that understanding and the um, misleading, uh, misleadings that come with that understanding. So the UNDP calls for, um, you know, fluidity of um, gender identity addressing um, that rigidity is not the answer and um, rigidity in gender division of labor is um, not the answer. So, um, it needs to move beyond that, the conversation needs to move beyond that to improve gender equality. So, as you can see, um, you know, these are the eight major areas that the UNDP focuses um, on and urges you know, nations, um, countries, groups, um, people to focus on in order to improve um, gender equality across the world. I do want to draw your attention to um, a very good documentary in this regard. Uh, it's called Pray the Devil Back to Hell and um, it was, uh, you know, it was in 2008 and it is in the backdrop of a social unrest in Western African Republic of Liberia where you see that um, the, Liber li the Liberian uh, women have come together um, to end a civil war that was uh, you know ongoing and their sole intention was to bring in peace um, to that place. And this documentary is a classic example of showing that how grassroots activism can be powerful enough to um, bring in, um, you know, um, ideas of um, nation building to bring in uh, changes um, nationally. So, um, if you um, if you get a uh, opportunity, please take a look at this documentary, um, "Pray the Devil Back to Hell." The other um, women's movement that is um, ongoing and that is, um, you know, something that is um, we see in our current times is the half the sky movement. So this is a movement that was pioneered by um, two journalists, um, Cheryl Woodon and Nicholas Kristof, and they started this movement um, in an effort to fight and end oppression of women and girls globally. 
So we see that in this movement in half the sky, it's um, you know again the resources um, with regard to half the sky are available everywhere. So you, as you will see, it addresses key issues um, you know of um, current times, um, such as sex trafficking, forced prostitution gender based violence and maternal mortality so these are the four um, you know major areas where have the sky actually um, concentrates on and it is um, it has landmark um, you know movements of current times so i encourage you to um, you know find out resources on have the sky to um, see you know what this current movement is about and um, you know again this is a, um, a short documentary um, as part of half the sky that you can watch um, online the impact of India's caste system on women so um, please take a look at it when you can um, to know about uh, the movement better so now I will um, take you through uh, some of the very recent uh, developments in terms of gender equality that was um, you know compiled by the UN women and this is um, again a resource that is available online so please um, you know go online to look for this timeline because um, you know there are way more examples than I am able to show you here so one of the um, most significant um, you know um, examples towards gender equality um, that we have currently in 2017 was that um, leadership uh, from African women and as you can see here that um, this was a landmark um, journey that was you know um, made um, you know on behalf of the um, African women and so this is um, one of the landmark moments in um, you know um, recent uh, women's movement. The next um, achievement uh, towards gender equality as the UN women has compiled um, was in June and uh, June to August um, 2017 where they have um, you know addressed the ill practice of child marriage and um, the to actually end child marriage in, in many parts of the world. You know, that was another um, you know step towards gender equality um, you know um, in, in current times in, in, in 2017 including they do talk about um, you know how um, the, the idea of child, um, child marriage actually plays out in the Indian uh, context um, as um, you know being unconstitutional um, not you know being supported by law and so um, you know this is another um, journey that uh, several societies have made in this regard um, towards gender equality. Of course um, we cannot ignore talking about the hashtag me too um, movement that um, you know um, that has been ongoing very recently and um, you know it talks about the um, the scale of sexual harassment and assault um, that women face across the world so the hashtag me too has become one of the um, very very significant um, women's movements uh, you know um, across the world in current times um, and you know as uh, you know as the hashtag me too movement um, you know continued we see that um, you know in, in Brazil they had an orange world without violence so they actually you know dedicated um, it to the hashtag me too that uh, you know just to raise more social um, consciousness against gender based violence. And finally we see that in Australia um, same sex marriages were um, legalized and this is again a step towards uh, you know uh, gender equality um, and uh, you know um, this is of very recent um, news of uh, December 2017. So um, and this is by no means an exhaustive list um, of examples as I said so please go and take a look at um, all the you know achievements or most of the achievements as compiled by the UN women um, in their timeline for gender equality um, as of 2017. So I want to conclude this lecture here with um, um, posing a question to you um, to reflect on that how has the discourse around women's movement changed 
if at all over the years. So, do you think that um, the public debates, the discourse, um, you know, the discussions around women's movement across the world, um, you know, ha has it changed over the years? What have been the signifiers of women's movement historically and in current times? So, what um, you know, what were the factors? What were the contributing um, events that have actually signified women's movement historically and um, in current times? What does this expose about gender relations across society? So, how has ideas of gender, how has ideas about gender relations changed, um, you know, across societies with regard to um, the women's movements across uh, time? If you want to take a look at, um, you know, more resources, please um, read the Global Women's Movement by Peggy Atrobus. And um, in the next lecture, I will take up from, you know, cues from this lecture and then talk about the theories of feminism. Thank you. Thank you.